Field with Five Trees by Hugh Walpole I was asked not long ago at one of those dinner parties where people ask such questions to describe for my fellow guests the oddest and queerest experience of my life. When one looks back, one discovers so many queer experiences. And then at the same time, one realises that most of them refuse not only description, but analysis. So I suppose with this one that I am about to relate, I went to keep an appointment. Five trees barred the way, and that was all there was to it. You can believe it or not, as you please. It happened years and years ago, before the war. I am now between sixty and seventy years of age, a widower with two grown-up children, on the whole content, although I have achieved so little, on the whole tranquil, even in this frantically disturbed world. It wasn't so disturbed then. I had been married for five years. I had no children. I was a writer of sorts, and lived in a little stone cottage, halfway up the hill from the village of Grange on Derwent Water, in Cumberland, where I still live. One of the important elements of this story if it is to be true at all, is that I shall be frank about Mary Ellen, my wife. Poor Mary. She has been dead for fifteen years, but still keeps me company, as those one has truly loved always do, however long their bodies have been dust. I think if Mary were to appear here now and give you an account of herself as she saw herself, she would agree very much with my estimate of her except that she never knew, as I did, how grandly unselfish, how sweetly forgiving, how beautifully maternal she was. She was, above all things else, long before she had any children of her own, a mother. She mothered me, who badly needed it, with a goodness, a sense of humour, and a tolerance that I have never known any other human being to equal. I loved her, and she loved me. But there came a time, as there comes in every marriage, when we were dissatisfied, fools that we were. Yet she loved me dearly, especially the companionship that we had. She was a wonderful companion. She had a grand, even a splendid sense of enjoyment. She loved little things. She was perfectly content on our small income perfectly happy to be there in the country alone with me from one end of the year to the other. The only thing that she wanted, that she hadn't got, was children. It was just a year after this strange adventure that we had our first child. We had been married, as I've said, five years, and suddenly everything went wrong. That is the queerest thing about any relationship between two human beings that for no reason at all everything suddenly moves out of perspective. Little personal tricks that have meant nothing for years are in a moment exasperating. Mary had, I remember, a habit of leaving the room without shutting the door, and contrariwise she would enter a room with a rush, banging the door behind her. Often she would look untidy. Her soft brown hair, which I had once thought the most beautiful thing in the world, would tumble about her forehead. She was not very clever about her clothes. She was strong, robust, rosy-faced, bright-eyed, clean like an apple. Sometimes, when she was happy, she would talk very loudly and with great excitement. I, on the other hand, in those days, took myself rather grimly. Oh, I was determined to become a great writer. A thing, God forgive me, that I have never managed to be. Oh, I was earning a fair income at that time with my novels and stories, but I thought that I had real genius, and that one day all the world would know it. 
Mary, I can see now, looking back, knew very well that genius I had not and would never have. Perhaps I detected, beneath her laughing praise and encouragement, this sense of disappointment. I was at that time meticulous in my habits. I liked everything to be very neat and careful about me. In fact, I took myself altogether with an absurd seriousness. I was immature for my years, and she knew it. I was always a boy to her, to the very end. Perhaps that also, without my knowing it, irritated me. We had, however, many things in common. We were, on the whole, amazingly happy. One joy that we deeply shared was our love for this especial country. I have no wish to employ pages of description in the manner of Mr. Fitz, the famous novelist, or Mrs. Grundy, the writer about gardens. But it is important to my little story that I should make it clear why Mary and I were happier here on this exact spot of ground than anywhere else in the world. It wasn't that I didn't know other places. I have experienced the long purple nights of Arizona, the lovely benignant glow of the Russian white night, the tawny boastful pride of the Pyrenees, the lakes and blossoms of Japan, the flowered valleys of Kashmir. I know that this small square of Cumbrian and Westmoreland ground can seem like a mud patch on a wet day, like a garish coloured picture postcard on a sunny afternoon in August, and shrivel up and disappear and disappoint. Do all the things that its detractors charge against it, but its beauty when it chooses to be beautiful. No other place in the world can boast of. This country was, in effect, the one thing that at this time Mary and I shared best with one another. Everything else began to have an edge, an edge of suspicion, mistrust, and danger. But at no time from the first to last did we lose our companionship in this country. And I had almost forgotten to mention the sign and seal of the whole affair. Namely, the field with the five trees. I can see it now as I look from my library window. Although it is closest and best visible from the windows of the bedroom Mary and I shared for so many years, and that I still inhabit. It is a field above Lodor, on the way to what Endlath, formed like a half-moon. Its grass is, under sunlight, of the intensest green. The five trees that edge the ground are so alike that they resemble the brother Volsong in Morris's Sigurd, except that they are not so tall as those splendid heroes were. I remember saying to Mary when we first came to the cottage that this field had eyes. Or rather, it was she, I think, who said that to me. We will never, she said, be able to do anything that we are ashamed of, because that field will always know it. It is, I am sure, looking after us. In any case, it became one of the great joys of our daily life, to awaken in the morning and see first thing that field, and those trees, so beautiful, quiet, permanent and strong. We both of us clung to it the more when our troubles began. These troubles were at first all on my side. Which of us does not know the times when we are irritable without reason, when shame at ourselves makes us yet more irritable, and when we strike at the persons we love most, because, I suppose, they will endure our tempers the most patiently. At first I thought I was ill that it was my liver or indigestion. Then I thought it was because my work was going badly, and here I began to complain bitterly of Mary. Whatever she said about it, my work was wrong. Then, examining myself and at heart, bitterly ashamed of my unreason, I decided that I was still a young man, and was I, because I had married a good English woman, to spend the rest of my days as a kind of hermit. And one dreadful evening I broke out with all this, saying so much more than I really meant, reproaching her most unfairly for things that she had never done, 
accusing her of being what she was not. That evening I desperately hurt her bride. She was so seldom angry, never sulky, and very, very hard to offend. But that evening I offended her. She said very little, only at the end, quietly. I'm sorry. I see that you should have married someone quite different. But I can't change, however much you might wish it. I'm myself. And she went out of the room. It was after this that Mary made her great mistake. She invited her mother to stay with us. I don't know, I shall never know, whether she did this in a spirit of feminine revenge, or whether it was simply that she thought the old lady would give her some companionship at a time when she must have been desperately lonely. Indeed, as I learned afterward, she was far more lonely and unhappy than I knew. I would say, in passing, that we never allow sufficiently for the loneliness of those near to us. We are aware often enough of our own loneliness, and cry out bitterly against it, but we think that we are exceptional creatures in this. Mary knew well enough that I detested her mother, Mrs. Millicent. She knew, too, that Mrs. Millicent cordially disliked me. Physically, she was unpleasant to me because she had bobbed her hair, painted her cheeks, wore dresses too young for her, and was altogether, I thought, a silly, tiresome, scandal-mongering old horror. And I did her a great injustice, as one always does when one dislikes people too much. She was courageous, had fine qualities of independence, adored Mary, and made a brave show of what life remained to her. She thought me idle, lazy, spoiled, and altogether unworthy of her daughter. Her hatred of Gumberland was almost fanatical. She was a sharp old lady, and very soon discovered something was wrong between us. When mothers discover that their beloved daughters are unhappy, and that sons-in-law whom they greatly dislike are responsible, they have only one ambition in life to punish the sons-in-law. And my mother-in-law wished not only to punish me, but also Cumberland, the English countryside, and everything rustic. She made at once my field with the five trees, a symbol of her attack. I really believe, Walter, she would say, that you could gladly sit all day and gaze at that silly field. Why don't you buy it if you are so fond of it? I have no doubt but that she also attacked Mary and tried to drag her secret from her. But there was no secret. We were moving in the dark. Away, away, and knew no reason why. One night I caught her to me and said to her, Mary, Mary, what is it? I don't know. I don't know, she sobbed. You don't love me any more. I do. I, I do, I answered her. But as I said it, I thought that I did not. I lay there, listening to the rain, and longed to escape, not only from Mary, perhaps indeed not from Mary at all, but chiefly from myself. I think that this was the first time in my life when, poor defenceless egoist that I was, I began to wonder whether I was worth anyone's bother. But at least it was a step in the right direction. Love acts always independently of lovers. Sometimes it moves with them. Then, with a shrug of its beautiful shoulders, it moves away. Catch me if you care, love cries. And there is no way to recapture its company, save to wait and be patient. But what lover ever was patient? And then the country deserted us. After all, if you worship a place, it demands, I suppose, on your part, a certain fineness of conduct. 
but we did not love the rain at that particular crisis in our lives. And, oh, how old Mrs. Millicent hated it. I am sure that she thought it of my providing. Then, as is always the way when the circumstances are ready for it, a quarrel emphasised the breach and made it appear intolerable. Breakfast is a dangerous meal, as many writers before me have observed. It was especially dangerous for Mrs. Millicent, for she was an old lady who should never meet her fellows before midday. But there she was, as fresh as her paint and powder could make her, drinking her coffee and thinking of her enforced unhappy rusticity. For many a day, Mary and I each read our paper at breakfast and threw to one another little excitements from China or the latest gossip from London. Mrs. Millicent did not read a paper, and therefore quite naturally hated that others should do so. On this especial morning I glanced at the pictures of my newspaper, and then stared across at my beloved field, just now almost fraudulently green, with the five trees guarding it. Well, said Mrs. Millicent, I have always hated that field, but at least I owe it something. It's made Walter polite at breakfast. And then I lost my temper. All the misery of the last weeks came out in that moment. I told the old lady all that I thought of her, all that I had ever thought of her. I blamed her for all the trouble between Mary and me. I said that I could not work while she was in the house. I said, oh, what matters now after all these years, the things that I said. Mrs. Millicent rose from her seat and said, Enough, Mary. I leave this house. And Mary, rising also, said, Mother, if you go, I go too. And the field looked across at me and veiled its green with shadow. Once again the rain began to fall. Of course the trouble was for the moment calmed. Later in the day I apologised. That night Mary said, Walter, what has come to you? What is it? Tell me, and I will help. I must help, or we're lost. Both of us. Which sounds melodramatic for Mary. But the word lost was true. We were indeed close to some fatal and irreparable separation. On the following day, so pat that it seemed as though fate were taking a maliciously personal interest in my small affairs, I met a lady. Here, even after all these years, I write with hesitation. Pearl Richardson is dead. I have not seen her for many, many years. I feel now that I never knew her, never had any real contact with her, that she was a shadow from a world filled with shadows. And yet, at this moment, as I sit here, she is more vivid and actual to me than men who have been my friends for a lifetime more vivid to me than any woman I have ever known, except Mary. I was in Keswick, miserable, without plan or purpose. It had been a wet morning, but the sun had come out, and the hills, as they so often are after rain, were sharp and brilliant, as though they had received an extra coat of paint. All the little town was gleaming and glittering, in the market square where I was standing, the light was almost blinding. Into this light stepped a young woman. I had been wondering what I would do. While I was hesitating, the girl passed me. She was wearing, as I so vividly remember, a dress of bright green, which ill suited her pale face with the light, fair eyebrows. Just after she passed me, she turned and looked at me. It was a look of quiet and considering investigation. She stood there, looking at me, and then came toward me, smiling. Could you tell me, she asked, where I can find the Keswick Art Shop? Oh, yes, I answered. It's straight along in front of you, over the little bridge, and you'll find it on the left. And as I spoke, it seemed to me that thereafter I would move like a man in a dream. 
I put it that way because I was still pausing on the border of that dangerous country. A moment's chance remained to me of turning around and walking away, and I knew with absolute certainty that if I did not walk away, I would be a free agent no longer. I have never felt that with any other man or woman before or since. But I suppose on that particular day I was acutely unhappy, very lonely, with that kind of hurt, pride and selfish resentment that comes from not getting one's own way. She was, and it seems very odd to me now, looking back, the exact opposite of Mary physically. She was pale, with rather weak grey eyes, with no cheerfulness, no sense of well-being about her at all. But my heart was thumping, and I even stammered a little as I said, If you will allow me, I am going that way, and I'll show you where it is. Thank you very much, she said, and she spoke as though it were no new thing for her to be escorted by a stranger. As we walked along, we said very little to each other. But by the time that we had reached the bridge, we had come to that sort of mutual agreement which strangers, who both want the same thing and want it badly, generally discover. We stood on the bridge before moving on, looking down at the little stream sparkling in the sunlight. She told me something about herself. She said that she was staying at the station hotel with a girlfriend, that she'd never been in Cumberland before, that it had rained ever since their arrival, and that this was the first bit of sunshine that she had had. And as she said that, she looked at me. You are so bored, I suppose, I said, that you'll be leaving early tomorrow. Oh, no, I'm not, she answered. Gracie, my friend, is. She can't stand the place. But I like it. It's grand when it rains. Oh, then, I said, this is the country for you. Yes, it is, she said. I don't know why I never came here before. Then she looked at me and said abruptly, You live here. Are you married? I said that I did live here and that I was married. That's a pity, she said. You're being married, I mean. Why? I asked her. Oh, because we could have seen a bit of each other if you hadn't been, she answered. We can anyway, I replied. I remember that little conversation as though the words are being spoken now in this room in front of me by two complete strangers whom I am coldly observing. I remember that I thought that I didn't like her, and that I should like her less the more I saw of her. I remember, too, a funny fancy that I had, that her green dress was like the green of my field in the sun. Yes, I remember that I didn't like her, and that I wanted there and then to take her in my arms and cover her face with kisses. Well, she was so different from anything that I'd known for so long that she seemed to me exactly what I desperately needed. And I suppose, too, in the low, dark cellars of my mind, there was the thought that I would teach Mary a lesson, and above all, show that nasty old woman, her mother, that there were other things in the world. I was certainly not the first man, nor the last, whom Miss Pearl Richardson tried to devour. In any case, whatever her purpose was, we succeeded in those few minutes in establishing a relationship. Before I left her, I had promised to give her dinner in Keswick the following evening. I was no less unhappy when I went back that afternoon, but I was almost wildly excited. Why, I'm afraid I cannot say. I've always thought that love, in spite of modern cynicism, is the finest thing in the world. Besides, at this particular moment, although I did not then know it, I loved Mary more deeply than I had ever loved her. Within a very few hours, Mary discovered that I had changed, and then, as she told me afterward, she began to be very frightened. It was that afternoon, she said many months later, that I thought for the first time that I might really be going to lose you. 
Up to then I had known something was very wrong, but I had been sure that nothing could truly separate us. But as soon as you came in that day, and with a kind of forced geniality greeted us, and talked with an empty friendliness about it, anything or nothing, so that I knew that your mind was elsewhere. I was terrified. I knew that there was someone, somewhere that I must fight. But I was fighting in the dark. I hadn't an idea what to do. I was to learn one more curious thing. Next morning, when I awoke and looked across at the field, I had a strange impression that it was nearer to me than it had ever been before. I could see every detail of it. It was almost as though I could count the blades of grass. I had always had the absurd notion that the five trees were active, that they could move, and sometimes I would look expecting to find only three there, or two. I lived, I suppose, although my memory of that is very faint, in a kind of armed truce with Mary during these weeks. Everything was unreal to me except Pearl. I remember that I hated her name. I thought it foolish and affected. And her first occasion for rapping me over the knuckles was my saying so. She was deeply offended. I was detached enough about her to realise that her vanity was excessive, and that everything that belonged to her, the special kind of rouge that she used, the flower that she wore on her dress, relations of hers, although she didn't like them, even places where she had been, were sanctified and important because she had had some connection with them. Even I took on a kind of importance because she thought that I was in love with her. I am quite sure that she was never in love with me, that she had from the very first a vindictiveness towards Mary, whom, of course, she had never seen, because if Mary had not been there, she could have swallowed me up more quickly. She was irritated, too, and more determined, because I would not make love to her, as other men had done. She said I behaved like a hero in one of the old story books, by which she meant, I suppose, that I did nothing more than kiss her. The odd thing was that she represented to me, and this I find the hardest of all to understand, adventure and romance. And yet I knew that she was common, no interest in anything except herself and men, that she would never be different from this. I think for these very reasons she became pathetic to me, someone whom I wished to protect, educate, as though she were a poor stray child come to me for help. Of all the sentimental nonsense, she was anything but a poor stray child. Women, I venture to think, are of two kinds. Either they must look up to the man they love, or they must protect him. Sometimes they must do both. With some women, the worse a man is, the more they must protect him. But with many women, as with Mary, if they despise, they cannot love. If I did this, she would despise me forever. And how fantastic it is upon looking back that I could seriously contemplate this flight with someone whom I neither admired or loved, throwing everything away for nothing at all. And yet this is what men so often do. I was afraid lest people should talk and Pearl therefore went to stay, of all places in the world, in the lonely hamlet of what endleth. That, now I think of it, was her principal virtue. She really did love this country. She would meet me in a little valley between what endleth and Lodor, or I would come up to the farm for tea, or she would be at the bottom of the hill in Rosthwaite. The day came when I agreed to go with her for a fortnight to Scarborough. I went back to my home that night, after it was settled, knowing quite well that I was, as Mary had said, a lost man. As I sat by myself that evening, looking across at my field, 
which now to my excited fancy seemed to be so close that it was almost staring in at my window. I felt the same excitement that I had known at the very first moment when I met the girl. It was a hot, feverish excitement, and when Mary came into the room and told me supper was ready, it was as though she were removed from me by a whole life of experience. I only wanted to sit beside the girl and look at her. When I was with her, I felt a sort of weariness, as though I'd had no sleep for weeks. But when I was away from her, I ached to be with her again. I had no satisfaction, no calm, no peace, whether with her or away from her. We made our arrangements. There was to be a trap waiting at Rothwaite. I was to walk over, meet her at the farm, take her down to the trap, and then we would drive away. A man from Keswick drove the trap with our bags out to Rothwaite and left it there, and early on a dark afternoon I started to walk up from the lake road. Dusk came very early at that time of the year, and I knew that we should have a dark walk down to Rothwaite. But the path was easy to follow, and I wanted nobody to see us. I left my house that morning to drive into Keswick. Mary and I had a few last words. You'll be back for supper? she asked me. Yes, I said. About seven. And that was really the first lie that I had ever told her. She said nothing, gave me one look, and then I left her. Now, this is the strange part of my little story. I can hardly expect you to believe me. I don't know that I even want you to. I only know that every word I say is true. I walked up the path, across the bridge above the tumbling stream, and then stood looking back at what is one of the loveliest views in the world, across Lodor to the lake. I passed the line of bungalows on my right, and came to my beloved field. As I reached its edge, darkness began to gather. It was too early for dusk, and yet the field was obscure, as though curtained by some thin mist. I was really out of breath, I leaned against a little stone wall, wondering what was the matter with me. As I stayed there, some thorn from a bush close by pricked my hand. I looked, but there was no bush near enough, I thought, to have touched me. The feeling of hostility greatly increased, and I wondered what was the matter with my nerves. I came away from the little wall and started to walk. The mist gathered more thickly, and I found myself wondering of all the things in the world, whether I would find my way, find my way when I knew this field and the path that ran beside it utterly by heart. But I suddenly thought, no, I will cross the wall and go up the other side, away from the field. But when I turned to find the wall, I found that I was slipping down a bank into the stream, it ran under the wall. I caught at the turf with my hand. It broke away. And before I could stop myself, I was down in the stream. I stumbled about among the stones, the water soaking into my shoes, and clambered up again. Then, as I reached the top, I felt exactly as though someone had struck me in the face. I had a momentary impulse to call out abusively as though it had been a living person. And then I realised my folly how strong the wind was, and yet it seemed nothing compared with so many other times I'd known. I couldn't find the stone wall again, so I turned and began to climb the field which runs on a gentle slope to the fell. The dusky light showed me quite clearly the separate forms of five trees. As I moved up the open ground, they were well away from me, yet very soon it was as though the wind was beating me toward the left. And although I moved forward, I seemed to make no real progress. It is a very small field and can be crossed in two minutes. But now, as the rain began to fall, striking my face, I felt as though I were blinded. I put my hand before my eyes, and then stumbled and fell onto my knees. And now I began to feel quite unreasoning terror. 
The rain was falling fast, and the mist was thick. But through the mist I seemed to see trees marching. I could see against the skyline the faint shape of the fell, which seemed an infinite distance away. I began to draw my breath with difficulty. It came in gasps, and my heart was hammering unsteadily. One knows that in nightmare dreams, and sometimes in actual fact, one moves round and round a very small space, losing altogether one's sense of direction. Now, when I moved forward, I could no longer see the line of the fell or the stone wall, but quite clearly outlined against the mist were five trees, forming, as it seemed to me, and this was, of course, an hallucination, a complete circle around me. So strong was this impression, however, and after all, what is reality except what one's fancy makes it, that I saw what I thought was a gap between two of the trees, and made desperately for it. And then the two trees seemed to close together and advance towards me. Panic seized me. I put my hands before my face and ran, stumbling forward. Once again, this time more severely, I dashed against what seemed to be now a wall of rough and hostile bark. I even called out, Let me go! Let me go! Then I fell on my knees. The air about me seemed to grow suffocatingly close, just as though the walls of a room were closing in upon me. I could smell the wet bark, the thin timber essence of branches. I put up my hand, touched a branch which broke, and then I felt tendrils about my leg. I began to beat with my hands, scraping the skin against the bark. The sense of suffocation grew more appalling with each instant, and the bitter scent of wet wood filled my nostrils. I rose to my feet and looked. I could see with absolute distinctness the five trees close ringed about me. They seemed to be of great thickness and intolerable height. It was as though they whispered to me an order. I obeyed it, and turned and climbed out with little frightened gasps. Down the hill toward Lodor I ran, as though dreadful destruction pursued me. I remember stumbling and falling, getting up again, going on past the bungalows, over the bridge, down the road to the lake, and then, somehow, I found my way home. Mary has told me since how I arrived at the house that night. My hat was gone, my face covered with scratches, bleeding, my clothes were torn, my knees soaked with mud. She was sitting, reading. When I appeared at the door, she stood up. I cried, Mary! Mary! and ran to her. Kneeling down before her and straining upward, I laid my bleeding face against her breast. That is all. I did not see or hear of Miss Pearl Richardson again until five years later. And there was a paragraph in the paper saying that in a lodging house in Sheffield, a woman named Pearl Richardson had killed herself by gas poisoning. This is the queerest experience of my life. And a year after this, as I've said, our first child was born, and until Mary's death there were not, I am sure, two happier married people anywhere in England. And the field of the five trees looks across at me now benevolently as I write. God allows us more protection from our follies than we know. Today's story was Filled with Five Trees by Hugh Walpole. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. I hope you enjoyed it, and 
Till next time. Sweet dreams. Thank you.